the Levy family has lived in Baghdad for generations. Ezra and his son Imad had stayed on throughout the Saddam years, living openly as Jews among their Muslim neighbors. Ezra Levy is now 83. He's one of the oldest of a fast dwindling tribe, the Iraqi Jews. Ezra was very keen to show me around his home. My wife and me. For Hanukkah. There was no doubt about it. I was in a typical Jewish home. But as we walked around the house, I was surprised to see Islamic symbols too. On one wall, an Arabic inscription bearing the opening words of the Holy Quran. Not something you would find in many Jewish households. Ezra disappears past the ferry lights up the stairs to retrieve something else of great sentimental value. He returns with a prized possession, an ashtray of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. Have you ever been there to Jerusalem? I like to go, but don't know. You think you will go in Maybe your... in the end of my life and see my family and son and dead. I had arrived at the Levy's home with a satellite phone. For the very first time, Ezra's son Imad spoke to relatives in Israel whom he has never seen. Ezra has not seen or spoken to his sister since she left Iraq 50 years earlier. I can't believe I am talking to my family in Israel. Do they say you must come visit? Yes, yes, no. You must come, not visit, you must come. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Ezra clearly had a lot of catching up to do. I can't stop myself for crying. My brother, what happened to you? I can't stop. I am crying and live the poor. Even though there were anxious times under Saddam, the levies were never physically threatened and they were supported by their Muslim neighbors. The regime of Saddam saying, we have uh, pressure here. Yes, we must be careful. Careful of everything. Every step we make it, we must be careful. And we are watched from a lot of people making reports. Ezra appeared to have no regrets about his decision to stay on in Iraq when so many other Jews left. His reasons were clearly emotional. Are you happy that you stayed here? Of course. Why? My friend here, I, am, I live here very good. No hurt, no any problem, no, the, uh, of the, everything good. Not far away, the looting goes on, with whole buildings being dismantled by organized teams. Like everyone else in Baghdad, the levies are worried about their security. Imad tells me that the last functioning synagogue in Baghdad was closed shortly before the war began because of security concerns and has not since reopened. He is the last rabbi of Baghdad and looks after the 35 mostly elderly Jews who still live in the city. Among his duties are to prepare kosher meat and to protect the holy scrolls, some of which are hundreds of years old. It's also his duty to find a wife and start a family but it is proving problematic. There aren't any young Jewish women left in Baghdad. Three months after I lost saw Ezra and Imad, Israel, in cooperation with the Americans, organizes a clandestine airlift of Iraqi Jews known as Operation Aid from Zion. Israel's Channel 2, with exclusive access to the new immigrants, reported breathlessly on the feat of transporting six elderly men and women to the Jewish state. To my surprise, Ezra was among them. 
Channel 2's cameras capture the moment he greets his sister for the first time in more than five decades. He appears bemused, even puzzled by his new status as a national hero. The interest in the story soon dies out, and when I finally caught up with Ezra, he had been moved into an old people's home. Ezra had always wanted to see his relatives in Israel before he died, but perhaps he hadn't contemplated how difficult the move would be. The new apartment was clearly not as spacious as his old home in Baghdad, and he was missing his son Imad, who was still in Iraq. Why my room? My teacher? This is for me. This is for me. There were few belongings he could truly call his own, but at least he had his much prized Wailing Wall ashtray. Ezra was told by the Israelis who organized the airlift that he must tell no one, including his closest friend, that he was leaving. It was a cry when he came to my house, asked my son, Where is your father? He said to him, In Israel. It was a cry, My friend, my brother. All the time we are together. This is not the Ezra I knew in Baghdad. He seems lost. I am alone. Nobody. Now I, I feel in my life. I am sick. At morning, this breakfast. At dining and evening, eat and come back to this place. That's it. I took Ezra to a cafe in Jaffa so he could meet and talk to some of the Palestinian locals. At last, he could speak Arabic again. Ezra's mood changed completely. The gloom of the old people's home was gone. Does this remind you of being in Baghdad? Yes, now I am thinking, I am saying in Baghdad, in copy in Baghdad, except this building, except this to play. And now I am feeling she's going back there. I asked Ezra whether he would like to go back to Baghdad. If I have a chance, why not? To see my friend, to see my son, to see my home, to see everything. You're lonely here. Are you lonely here? No. What I said to you, I don't know. Ezra is trying to reconcile his dual identity of being both Arab and Jew. We are Arabic. And I am Jew is Arabic. My country is Arabic. All of us, we are Arabic. But I am, we are good. There is Muslim, there is Christian, there is Jew. We are good. But we are all people in Arabic. We are Arabic. I followed Ezra from Baghdad to Jaffa. Every step of the way, he's challenged the stereotypes. A Jew whose best friends were Muslims, who displays the Quran next to Hanukkah candles. Little surprise, perhaps, that this new Jewish citizen of Israel has rewritten the script once more.